Good afternoon. I am Jennifer Widman, director of the South Dakota Center for the Book. The State Center is an affiliate of the Library of Congress Center for the Book in Washington, D.C. Our mission is to promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy with a special emphasis on promoting the unique literary heritage of each state or territory. The authors in this video are from the Western Two region of the United States. Their books were chosen by the State Affiliate Centers for the Book to represent each state's literary heritage. These great reads from great places are chosen every year by the Affiliate Centers, and you can see the entire list from this year and from preceding years at read.gov slash greatreads. These authors are here to discuss their work, and they will also, in the, in the process, address the theme of this year's National Book Festival, which is Everyone Has a Story. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation and consider listening to all the authors in these Great Reads videos. Together, they are a testament to the richness and diversity of this nation's literary creativity. I am going to start by having our authors introduce themselves briefly and give us the two to three sentence summary of their featured book. And I'm gonna go through that in alphabetical order by state, which means we start with Arizona. Hello, my name is Ronnie Cabin Rivera Ashford. I am delighted to be here with all of you. And my book, Raulito, the first Latino governor of Arizona, or Raulito, el primer gobernador Latino de Arizona, is a bilingual biography about our first and only to date Latino governor who came to the US at two years old in 1918. He was born in Mexico. He also went on to become a teacher, an attorney, a superior court judge, a county attorney, and other than governor, he was U.S. ambassador to Bolivia, El Salvador, and Argentina. He left us quite a legacy. Thank you. Thank you. Colorado. Thank you so much for hosting this event and inviting us all to be here today. I'm Olivia Chada. I write uh, science fiction, fantasy, comic books, and graphic novels for middle grade, one, young adult, and adult audiences. Uh, Rise of the Red Hand was my YA debut, and book two is coming out next year, Fall of the Iron Gods. I'm also a contributor to the anthologies The Gathering Dark, Magic Has No Borders, and an upcoming Star Wars anthology, Return of the Jedi, from a certain point of view. Uh, Rise of the Red Hand is about a street rat turned revolutionary and the disillusioned hacker son of a politician who try to take down a technocratic government that sacrifices its poorest citizens to build its utopia. Um, the South Asian province is split into two. Uplanders lead luxurious lives inside a climate controlled biome dependent on technology and gene therapy to keep them healthy. Outside, the poor are forgotten and scraped by with discarded black market robotics, a society of poverty-stricken cyborgs struggling to survive in slums threatened by rising sea levels, unbreathable air, and deadly superbugs. Thank you. Next up is Montana. Hi, I'm Sabrina Ha. And I'm AJ Ochen, and our book is about the Battle of Arrow Creek, which is the most important event in Crow history because um, they were being attacked by several Plains tribes that wanted to annihilate them to take over their land, which was the Yellowstone River, basically, which was the most beautiful land that existed, very, very rich in resources. We placed a fictional character, Elk Morning, in the battle, um, and that's our book. Anything you want to add? All right, thank you. Then we move on to New Mexico. Hi, I'm Celia Perez, and I am so pleased to have my uh, third middle grade novel, Tumble, represent the state of New Mexico this year at the uh, National Book Festival. Tumble is the story of a kid named Adela who has a big decision to make after her stepfather um, makes a proposal that could change her life. Um, so the story takes us through a journey with Addie as she plays detective to try to find out who her biological father is. 
Um, and when she learns his identity, she also discovers that she comes from this family of um, luchadores and uh, learns a lot about herself and about this uh, expansive group of people that um, make her who she is. Thank you. And now to North Dakota. Buju Hanin. My name is Denise Ajmedir. I live on the Trill Mountain Reservation uh, here in North Dakota. And my book, Josie Dances, is about a young Ojibwe girl who uh, will be entering the Pawa Arena for the first time. She needs help making her fancy shawl regalia. Miigwech. Thank you. And then to South Dakota. Hi, my name is Lauren Harris. I'm very thankful to be here. Um, and my second picture book is the one that will represent South Dakota this year. It's called A Place for Harvest, the story of Kenny Higashi. And Kenny was a first generation Japanese American born in South Dakota. And the story, um, which is based on the true story of Kenny, um, takes place in his small agrarian town in the Black Hills of South Dakota and takes him all the way to a very famous unit of soldiers that were all Japanese American soldiers in World War II. And um, I'm very excited to be able to share this story with children. Thank you. And then we move on to Texas. Hi, my name is Ann Winter, and I'm very excited to be here with all these wonderful authors. Uh, I write children's books, specifically picture books and board books, and my book is called Nell Plants a Tree. It's a story that goes back and forth between the past and the present to tell about a young girl who planted and nurtured a tree, and then also her descendants who get to enjoy that tree um, in many different ways, whether it's making pecans or gathering pecans to make a pie, uh, racing to the tree, enjoying its shade, and reading a book. Um, so it shows the impact of a, how a seemingly small action can impact generations to come. Thank you. Um, Utah is next. Hi, my name is Melissa Marstead, and I write in Utah. And since about 2016, I've been getting on the road and researching national parks all around the country. So actually the book that was awarded from Utah this year is the 10th in my series, and it's called Ole's Dark Sky Journey. And it's about a threatened Mexican spotted owl that goes around our state to visit 20 international dark skies. Um, there are over 200 international dark skies in the world and Utah has 20. So nearly you know, 10% of the international dark skies. And um, I often write about endangered species and try and explain to children and adults the importance of um, being aware of nature and our animals. I am Alfreda Bairdro, and then last and but not least, I am a Wyoming. citizen of the Lakota Nation, and I'm an author and uh, illustrator. And uh, my book, The Day the Earth Rolls Up, is my first book. And I'm grateful to Wyoming for selecting my book to represent the state and also our sacred site, Montotipila, which is the location for my book. My book is about seven sisters that are about to be eaten by a giant bear and they plead and for help. The earth rises up and a giant eagle comes to their rescue and they are transported to the stars where they become Pleiades that we see in the night sky. Thank you. I appreciate all of you giving that overview on your books. And you know, I can already tell that we've got some, uh, some common themes about care for the land, about people who did extraordinary things, uh, about important cultural uh, activities and events. So I think that's just wonderful. Um, there's a lot of diversity here for young readers to enjoy and learn from. So I'm going to start just asking some individual questions about your books, but I'm going to keep going in state alphabetical order. So that means we are going back to Arizona. And um, I wanted to ask you, Ronnie, what is the story behind when you began writing? 
Oh, and you'll need to make sure to unmute. I'm still seeing the mute. There we go. All right. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, so the story behind the story is that when I met Raul Castro, who I still to this day, and he's passed away, it's been uh, eight years now, I still refer to him as governor, although he had many other titles. Um, when I met him, I had written and had published two children's bilingual books, picture books. Um, you can see them be behind me in my bookshelf. And my Nana's Remedies, Los Remedios de Mi Nana, and Hip Hip Hooray, It's Monsoon Day, or Ahua Ya Llegó El Chubasco, are two books that I took to gift him and his wife. He was living at that time in my hometown on the border of Arizona and Mexico, Nogales, Arizona. And he and his wife chose to live there in retirement because he loved living on the border and that is a friendly border town. And it was just so exciting to meet him and take him this gift of my first two books. That was all I had at that time. Not knowing that he grew up with a mother who was a curandera, a healer and a midwife. And my Nana's Remedies is about a grandmother who is helping heal her granddaughter with teas and natural remedies. So when I gave it to him, he was delighted and he called me and asked me if I would come back and visit him and he told me why. And then he gifted me his autobiography. And when I started reading that, I actually, within a week or two, had woke up and I had had a dream. And I don't remember my dreams often. And in this dream, I kept hearing, Raulito becomes the governor. Raulito becomes the governor. And I just had this sense that I needed to write his story. So I had a friend who was a very good friend of his ask him if he would be willing to give me that blessing. And he was delighted. So that's the story behind the story of Raulito. Wonderful. Sounds like some serendipity at work there. Absolutely. Yes. Um, next, moving to Olivia from Colorado or representing Colorado. Um, what are your inspirations as a writer and specifically what inspired you to write Rise of the Red Hand and the second book in that series? I think living in this world today, so much um, comes down to the concept of empathy. And as a whole, as a community over the past several years, we've kind of noticed that um, there's been this bigger distance between different groups of people and it's easier online to engage with people in a callous way instead of more empathetically. And I feel that I really wanted to write a book that showed how uh, two individuals from very different parts of this um, uh, geographical space could build empathy for each other. And not only just to understand the other person's point of view, but to actually fully understand the concept of how did we get into this ecological disaster? Why are we doing the things that we're doing? And how can we actually come together as a people um, to fix the problems that we've created. Um, and so they're in this in this novel and this series, it has a lot of high flying fun science fictional elements, but it's really set today. And it really does, or in this world today, but in a few hundred years, and it really does kind of look at um, our potential paths in humanity um, if we do choose not to do certain things down the road. And so I really wanted to take a look at that and understand and also kind of create a, an example for young people to show these core elements of the environment 
and our choices um, so that we could hopefully come together to, to form some solutions. Something to take hope from, at least, at least we would like to see that, right? That's great. Um, Montana, AJ and Sabrina, um, you are interpreting the, a specific traditional story, I believe, or historical story. What, who told you first the story or who made you aware of it? Where did it come from for you? Um, my mom actually told me the story when I was younger. Um, it's actually a historical um, story that the elders in Crow have always told to um, younger kids, younger generation for the past hundred years. So we just kind of did our own interpretation of it. But there are different versions of this story. That's true. It's a true story. Um, and uh, what I didn't say the first time is that the crow were it was a ten they they were outnumbered ten to one, and yet they they survived and they beat off the enemy. That's why it's so important because you know, the crow still have basically the largest reservation in Montana, don't they? And, compared to the other tribes. So they they survived and pretty much thrive, I think, today. So we, we live in Crow country, and it's important that we know the history of the Crow. Yeah, absolutely. And and this allows for younger readers to start learning that history, even well, if they don't have parents to tell them. We are in the curriculum now. This book is in the, this book <laughs> is now in the Montana curriculum. And we're very happy about it. Oh, that's that's wonderful. All right. So we'll move to New Mexico. And I'm going to ask you, Celia, about your inspiration as well. This is a book about wrestlers, which I don't see that many of. Where did that idea come from? Well, um, initially, it, it came from my own childhood obsession with wrestling. Um, I usually start a, a book, um, not with a full fledged story, but with some details that I know I want to create a story around. And um, for Tumble, the, you know, the very earliest detail was that I knew I wanted it to be a book about wrestling. Um, I grew up in the 80s and um, wrestling was just huge. I watched everything, hours of it every weekend from the big productions, the really flashy ones like the WWF to um, the really small territory productions from around the country. And um, I also remember watching um, as a child, um, these movies from Mexico, these Lucha Libre movies that featured um, really big uh, masked celebrity wrestlers from Mexico, like Min Mascaras and El Santo. So I wanted to write a story about this thing that was such a part of my life when I was um, a child. And um, I always think of wrestling as a, as a form of story storytelling and it had these very similar elements to other forms of storytelling that I was obsessive about as a kid, um, namely mythology and uh, telenovelas, <laughs> uh, which all seem like very different things, but have a lot in common. You know, there's always a bad guy and a good guy and um, sometimes those identities switch and the lines get blurred and you don't know which one is which. Um, they have these larger than life characters and there's a lot of drama and I knew that I, um, that I also wanted to write a story about family. And I thought, um, you know, all of these types of storytelling tend to have this, you know, family drama, um, including wrestling, which is a sport of families. If anyone um, follows it or was ever a fan of it, you know that there are a lot of families involved in, in professional wrestling, um, biological families, but also made families. And the story is a lot about made families as well. You know, the families that you create that are not necessarily people you have biological ties with. So. Um, I thought wrestling and families were a good match, no pun intended. <laughs> For sure, there is a lot of drama and there are a lot of stories and character relationships. So <laughs> um, on to North Dakota, Denise, with Josie Dances, um, you address powwows and specifically fancy shawl dancers. Can you tell us a little bit about those for people who might not be familiar with um, either the event of a powwow or the style of fancy shawl dress? Yes, um, well, I've been a dancer for most of my life. 
and so are my kids and my grandkids. So this is uh, loosely based on, um, on my daughter and uh, she was a fancy shell dancer. But uh, so powwows uh, are, are all over the United States, especially this summer. Uh, well, they go all winter too. Um, so for, for this book, um, a lot of powwow dancers, uh, when they, uh, a family, when they want to introduce their, their child into the powwow arena will have a ceremony. And it just sort of <clears throat> is telling everybody at the powwow that this child is, um, it would just welcome this, uh, this new dancer into the powwow arena. So that's, uh, that's what the book is about. And um, so Josie uh, is Lucy based on my daughter. I said, and um, she's a young Ojibwe girl, but she needs to have an outfit. And so she asked her, her mom and her aunties and her grandma um, to make her an outfit, um, you know, to do the, we, the fancy shawl dancers have nowadays, they have a cape, they have a shawl, they have dresses, they have leggings, beaded leggings and, and, and beadwork. So um, she goes around and asks them to um, make her, her outfit and they work on it all, all winter long. And um, we'll see if, uh, if everything is done by the time the powwow comes around, which is actually our tribal powwow, which is in, uh, at the end of August and September. So it's um, sort of based on, on my tribe. All right, very good. Incorporating family in a new, another way there. So, um, Lauren, representing South Dakota. This is a, a book based on a true story, like a couple others are. Um, how did you run across the story of Kenny Higashi and the things that he experienced? Well, I love this year's theme of everyone has a story because I learned this as I was a reporter, also a freelance journalist for six years and just was able to go around in the community and meet uh, different people. And just, we all have a story to tell. Um, sometimes they don't get told at all. And so it was fun to be able to be a part of that. But I, as I was thinking about these things, I started to write a story about that came from my family. And um, that was became my first picture book. And it centers around a family uh, in Los Angeles who had a wonderful relationship with their Japanese American neighbors, but went through a really difficult time in our history um, around the World War II uh, era, but also for the Japanese American community to go through the internment. And so I was researching for this first picture book. And I, I know from my being a uh, journalist that it's always good to find a source that was in the place that you're researching or the time and experienced it firsthand. And I thought, well, in the small rural area in Black Hills, how will I ever find anyone who was a part of the, the Japanese American experience of specifically the soldiers in World War II who have an extraordinary um, record and legacy that they've left for us. And I thought, how will I ever find one? And lo and behold, there was a gentleman that lived literally down the street from me and his name is Kenny Higashi. And he, when I met him, he was 94 years old. And he indeed was a first generation Japanese American born in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And he was a part of the 100th 442nd All Japanese American Regimental Combat Team in World War II, during World War II. And so he uh, was able to help me with research. You can see my book behind me, research for my first book, but then I, as I listened to him and his experiences um, in the Black Hills before the war and during the war, um, during his service, I felt like it was really important to share that with everyone. And I'm so grateful that he shared his story with me, which he really hadn't done before. Yes, that's wonderful. Sounds like a story that could otherwise have been lost. So yes, that's great. Um, Texas. You, uh, with Nell Plants a Tree, you are actually weaving together two narratives from different time periods, which can be kind of a complicated thing to do. You know, sometimes people think children's books are simple, and I would argue that, no, they're usually not simple. And in this case, you had to do something kind of challenging. So how did you navigate that structure in a picture book? 
Yeah, that was actually the hardest part, I think, of writing Nell Plants a Tree because, um, for example, it opens with uh, a child trying to climb a tree and it's describing how she's trying to climb the tree. And then we go back and we see her grandmother first finding the seed that she's going to plant. Um, and it was a ton of trial and error of just going through different structures, having a lot of faith that hopefully this will work out, but seeing it not work out and not work out and not work out. Um, and one thing that I realized is that I wanted to have the descriptions of the present be more detailed and longer, and then the descriptions of the past kind of encapsulated in one statement, because that's kind of how we perceive the present and the past. I think if you had to recall yesterday, you would be able to say what you ate and some details of what you did throughout the day. But if you're recalling 20 years ago, you might just remember the big events. Um, so that was a realization I had in trying to figure out that structure. And then fortunately, working with the illustrator, Daniel Miaris, he did a lot of the lifting for helping to make those two timelines very distinct through his use of color and through his, the way that he um, gives the, the main character of Nell a certain color dress that she wears at different ages so you can track her through the book. Uh, so there were a lot of things working together to make those two timelines work, which I was really grateful for because I, the whole time I was writing it, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull this off. Um, so I'm glad it, it turned out the way it did. Yeah, that also illustrates, you know, no pun intended, the importance of the illustrator and how much of a storytelling um, aspect that is. So um, Utah, um, Melissa, I, I know that you have a couple of goals with um, your book, and one of them is that you want people to learn a little bit more about the International Dark Sky Parks. So um, can you talk about what that means, what, what kind of places these are? Um, why there are so many in Utah, maybe? <laughs> well, um, I've written, I originally wrote a children's book about Utah's five national parks. Um, and so I travel around the state um, looking for retailers and doing more research. And I happen to go to um, a state park in Southern Utah on the border of Arizona called Gooseneck State Park. And I had never been anywhere so dark, so quiet in my entire life. And I knew about the dark skies, but that's where the where I was intrigued to take the idea of the international dark skies in Utah and turn it into a book. And then when I started researching the dark skies, I learned I knew Utah had a lot, but we have almost 24 international dark sky parks and towns. We have two towns in the state that have been designated as um, dark sky cities, Tory and Helper. Um, and the International Dark Sky Parks Association is actually um, in Tucson, Arizona. So around the world, we have 200. And so then I've traveled around um, to almost every single one of the dark skies that I write about in the book. Um, but that's what I try and do is explain the importance of dark skies where there's no light penetration and where we can see the Milky Way. Um, that has a lot to do with it. And um, there are other guidelines that um, parks have to go through in order to be designated. Yeah, it's probably something most of us don't even realize we're missing out on. Yes. Um, and Wyoming. Um, Alfreda, can you tell me, this is your first book, right? Yes. Yeah, so where did the inspiration for it come from? What made you say, I need to write this story? Well, my passion for writing uh, is born from, from my passion for art. I love uh, art forms, all art forms. And I would say it's a it was a collection of um, uh, personal experience, oral traditions from various tribes and my imagination. And it was meaningful to me because, again, it was at Montotipila, uh, one of our sacred sites for various tribes. And so I, um, I basically thought about 
uh, I wanted to create emotion. Um, and I worked back and forth with my illustrations and my words uh, because I wanted my young readers to feel the magic of Mosque and her sisters and the ventures as they ran from danger and they soared to the sky you know, on the back of a giant eagle and feeling the wind in their hair. I wanted all that to kind of create emotion so that maybe years from now, when they're grown up and they look and see Pleiades, they can remember my book. And, um, and so I, that's, that was my goal. And I was surprised, uh, uh, it, I did it mainly for me, and I was surprised it was so well received. Uh, and so I just wanna say that the theme is wonderful because everyone does have a story. And the way that I write, um, I wrote this, like I said, with images, I write my novels uh, and they're, um, they're our foundation of our culture with oral traditions. And in, in our tra oral traditions, as with my book, uh, uh, there's a protocol of how to, be, uh, how to be in balance with nature and the earth, our mother. And so again, I'm just thrilled that um, I could share this with, with the world and with the youth. That's wonderful. So, so many wonderful stories here, I think, that, that can be so impactful um, to youth, whether historical, current, cultural, all of those things. That's, that's great. I wanna do at least one more round of questions. So we're gonna go back up to the top of the alphabet with uh, Arizona. Um, you talked a little bit about how you got to writing your most recent book. Can you tell me a little bit about the timeline of, of the process? You know, How long does it take from the time that you're speaking with someone and getting his information to actually putting it in book form and getting it out in the world? Sure, I'd be happy to speak about that. Uh, and it's different, I believe, for every book, every title, the different publishers. Uh, my, my very first book, My Nana's Remedies, that took me 65 rejections before I actually found the publisher, the right publisher. And that was over several years. And I, I would like to encourage anyone who is thinking of writing or wanting to publish. And nowadays, there are many different ways to do that, including self-publishing. Um, don't give up if it's something that you really feel deep in your heart. And that's how I have felt about all of my books. Um, my book, Raulito, the first Latino governor of Arizona, is my first YA biography. All of my other books have been uh, bilingual picture books. And also I did a few for Disney for the Coco movie. Um, with Raulito, when, when the, the thought came to me through the dream and I reached out to him, uh, at that point, Governor Castro was 96 years old. It reminded me of um, the person who wrote him Kenny and met him when he was 94. So um, yes, I met Governor Castro when he was 96 and right around his birthday, which was two days after mine. And then um, he lived for another two and a half years. So he passed, he was almost 99. Um, we worked on this together for a year and a half that I interviewed him. And when I first created this story, I was thinking it was going to be an extended picture book for older uh, children. And as I tried to pitching it for about four or five years because I was really stubborn and stuck in my genre of picture books, um, it was well, the story was very well accepted, but the picture book idea was not. And so then I had to change. So yes, I, I interviewed him after, after we met and after I had this idea and he was very excited about having 
a book for young people written that would be for young people and, and people of all ages, really, about his story and know that it would be bilingual was even more exciting. Uh, it took, the whole process took about nine years because for the first four and a half to five years, I was stuck in the idea of it being a picture book, which all of my other previous books that were published were. But eventually I gave in, I wanted this story so badly and I followed what I learned from him, which is dream big, always do your best and never give up. And that's how Raulito came about. It took about nine years for the whole process. So never give up. And um, he, he did the same thing in his life. You know, he was born in Mexico. He came to the U.S. when he was two years old. In those days, they didn't ask for papers and there wasn't any such thing as immigration um, in the formal sense of the, what the issues are now. And he went from walking barefoot to school four miles one way each day because he was Mexican and was not allowed to ride the school bus to wearing leather embossed boots with the Arizona state symbol on it that were gifted to him when he became governor. So he did quite a bit in his life, plus the U.S. ambassador three times. And this book is so important because it really is bringing light to hidden history. Because, because of the discrimination, um, it amazes me that the border town that he grew up in and graduated from high school as a football star and many other athletes that he had to his name, students today that graduate from high school, they do not know who he is. Even though there's a park there in his name, um, they they don't know who he is. So I'm hoping like um, one of you women, amazing women said that your book is now um, from Montana. Yes, the um, part of the curriculum in the state, that is what my dream is for Raulito because this is an amazing true story that will inspire generations to come. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, to Colorado and Olivia, um, you are writing science fiction. You're writing something that's partly set in the future, but all of course, it's based on all sorts of real events. Um, I know that there is a focus that has to do with climate change. I believe there's a pandemic that sneaks its way in there. So there are definitely real life uh, considerations. Can you talk a little bit about that? How, how real life and fiction intertwine? Of course. So in my process of writing this book, I spent a lot of time um, studying during my PhD, the partition of India and borders and boundaries around the world. And I became really interested in the idea that how the balance of power shifts when these borders change um, and also simultaneously became interested in <clears throat> climate and uh, climate change and how that conversation and discourse of climate tends to be uh, one that involves most people in power. Um, it really doesn't always include people who are, um, you know, on the other side of the tracks or people who need or uh, are, are, it's not an inclusive conversation in so many ways. And so I spent a long time thinking about the partition of India and thinking about borders and boundaries and then thinking about climate as a whole and um, researching maps, researching future predictions of the environment, what the world might look like in 200 years if we don't do certain things, who will be most impacted by these changes. And of course, um, the most vulnerable and most marginalized gr groups of people around the world are impacted most by climate change. And I really wanted to kind of illustrate that. And it was a very strange experience when the book was being edited, um, COVID happened. And I already had this, um, this virus um, kind of a part of the book. And it became a moment where 
And I think a lot of people have been writing about viruses. It's not like I was this person who wrote about the virus. It was something that a lot of people have this in there because it becomes a question of how close are we coming to nature? What are we doing? Are we being responsible in our interaction with the natural environment? And when we do kind of cross into these um, precarious boundaries, things can happen. And so we see that happening a lot in the world today. And so overall, just looking at in this fantastical landscape where in, I've said that in a science fictional future, all those elements are very much based in science and reality. Um, I think someone famous said, you know, when you do write about the future, you come straight up to face the present more than anything, our present day anxieties and the questions we have about our, our lives. Um, so as a whole, it was a fun research project and also um, interesting to see how these two elements kind of collided. Yes, it definitely sounds like it. Thank you. Um, for Montana, um, we can you talk a little bit about First of all, where the name Elk Morning came from, and second, why the Battle of Arrow Creek is so significant in Crow history. Um, so the name Elk Morning came from uh, all of the characters in our books are based on um, our Indian names. So Elk Morning is kind of um, part of, it's actually my, my grandma's, my grandmother's, um, that's one of her names. Also the chief mm -hmm. character is Praise in the Morning. Yeah, and there, there's a chief in there. His name's Chief Praise in the Morning, and that's Praise in the Morning is my Indian name too. And Elk Morning, it, we started these books off as a, um, we have another series about a little girl. Her name's Lily Goodpath, and Elk Morning is her cousin. So, and now his, these books are kind of Elk Morning's journey to becoming a great war chief. War chief. And so, he's counting through. so he, he's on this journey and he's counting through. And there are four clues to count, but one thing we wanted to do is be an Indian education for all, uh, because that's what got it into the curriculum. Our first three books, uh, we didn't meet the criteria for Indian education for all because we we used several tribes. I mean, Lily Goodpath is a Crow girl, but we used a story from a, our first story was a Cheyenne story that we interpreted. And so therefore it didn't meet the criteria of being tribally specific which was very important. So we realized that we needed to focus on just Crow. And that's when we started the Elk Morning series, Elk Morning is all Crow. And so both the Elk Morning books and hopefully all the Elk Morning books to come are in the curriculum and because they meet the Indian education for all criteria. And, yeah. and this, um, this story, this battle of Arrow Creek, which is one of, the biggest stories that I heard when I was younger, growing up, it was uh, Elk Morning, or actually it was at the, um, it was National. towards uh, Pryor. And so there's all these other tribes and they're trying to annihilate Crow. And there it was like a big um, 10,000 versus like, 2000 mm -hmm. um war um in a and uh war party or the battle and these so there is all these events these uh, events that happen that in in our story one of them is there was some elk there in the in the background and they were stomping and they were blowing up the dust and so in the um, enemy, they thought that that was a big um, battle of, of war chiefs that were sitting there with their war bonnets. And they thought there were thousands of them. 
and then there was also the buffalo and they were they were out there too um picking up the dust and then there was uh this this warrior this mystic warrior that nobody ever saw but he was out there and he was he was un untouchable and unattainable he was but he was out there and he was every single and he was killing these other on um, this enemy tribe and then they started to back off but the um crow they didn't know they never saw this guy they never saw this warrior he was um mystic he was a mystic, mystic warrior yeah so there was all these events and it was just kind of shows that uh, there were miracles, three miracles. Yeah, happened. it just shows that there was the. So these things happened, something happened to save the crow. Yeah. Because it was impossible that they won the battle. Impossible. The odds were completely against them. Um, it was 10 to one. And for them to survive, it took three miracles for it to happen. And that's why it's such a, that's why it's a story that is told and retold and retold um, because the, the, all, the, uh, the thousands of other tribes that came to annihilate them had to leave the battlefield because of the elk and the buffalo and the mystic warrior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's why it's such an important story. Well, that's, that's wonderful. It was a, an effort among all the relatives, not just the, the human ones. So wonderful. Thank you. Um, New Mexico. Celia, I want to know a little bit about the research you did for your book. You could probably say you started when you were a kid watching wrestling. And also in the course of that, how did you research it so that it was more detailed? But I also really want to know uh, whether you have a Lucha Libre mask. <laughs> I do. My editor gave me one and sent me one when Tumble was published. <laughs> um, so research is probably my favorite part of the writing process and also the most dangerous part of the writing process for me, because I, I'm sure all of us, everyone here has done a lot of research for their work. Um, it's where you fall into those rabbit holes that are kind of hard to get out of, climb out of. Um, but it's also where you discover all the like really interesting details of, you know, the story that you're writing. Um, and yes, my diary from when I have a few diaries from when I was uh, um, a wrestling fan as a child and I turned to those um, as part of my research just to sort of get back into that age and that feeling of you know really loving this thing and um, they're uh, a little embarrassing to look at because they are like from beginning to end wrestling um, even on my birthday, there's just like a PS, uh, today is my birthday <laughs> because the rest of it was about what happened on wrestling over the weekend. Um, but, um, but, you know, in looking at the theme of everyone has a story to tell, I, I find, you know, looking at a diary, just being able to look back at you know, my own story as a 13, 12 year old. Um, I also read, I do, I mean, I tend to do research even when I know a, a good amount about a topic, um, but I read books on the history of professional wrestling. Um, there's a lot of jargon in the world of professional wrestling, so I kind of read up on that. Um, there are a number of scenes where there are wrestling matches. Uh, I had not, I've not been a fan of wrestling for a long time, so I had to kind of go back into that world, so I watched a lot of um, uh, wrestling matches online. Most of the book, pretty much the entire book was written during the pandemic, so um, as far as traveling and going to live events, um, I was pretty limited, so I did watch a lot online. Um, I think one of the most curious things I might have done for the research process was um, I found out the size of a wrestling ring, and there is um, a wrestling ring in someone's yard in this uh, in the story, and so I went into my backyard and uh, measured out what a wrestling ring would look like in my own backyard, just to see, like, have a visual of what that would be. Um, and I do have room in my backyard if anyone at some point wants to come over and wrestle. Um, uh, another thing I did for um, the research process, because I couldn't travel, I had done a, a um, school visit with uh, a school in Albuquerque, and I was really, part of the story takes place during the holidays, and I wanted um, to know what how, how the holidays were celebrated in the area and um, the different traditions and foods that um, that people 
um, used to observe the holidays. And so I had, I asked the kids during my um, school visit, this was a middle school, um, to share some of that information and share those details. And, and they did. Um, but, um, and then just a lot of just online, you know, having friends send photos and trying to get a visual looking at maps. And um, I think this is one of the most exciting parts when I talk to school kids, um, just the whole process of, of researching and, you know, there always being something new to learn about something that you think you know a lot about. Yes, it sounds like you, you did as much as you could, including creating your own wrestling or seeing if you had room to create one, at least. <laughs> um, North Dakota, I want to go back to Denise um, and ask about um, Josie Dances, I believe, is your first book for children, but you had written before, you had academic writing, is it memoir type writing, things like that. What was the the change? What did you have to do in order to get yourself in the right mindset to write for children? Or what did you find different about it? Um, well, I'm mostly known as a poet. So I have four poetry books out and I'm working on my, my next book of poems. I was just uh, uh, selected as North Dakota Poet Laureate, uh, the first Native American for the state of North Dakota. So I'm working on poetry. Um, so with, within Josie Dances, uh, writing it, you know, 700 words, but it, it took a lot of still revisions and working with the editor and so on. But I still try to incorporate some poetry, you know, some inner rhyme and chime um, within the story, which was fun uh, for me as a poet. Uh, so um, I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about so the illustrator, if we have some time, um, the illustrator is Angie Angie Erdrich, and she is also a pediatrician, and she is also one of uh, some very talented uh, Erdrich sisters. But the Minnesota Historical Society let me, uh, they vetted uh, three three artists, and she's a watercolor artist, and she, she won the, the vetting. So we had so much fun uh, working on Josie dances. We actually went to powwows, and she took pictures, and we got permission from some friends to incorporate um, some of the, the dancers in there. So on the inside um, for children uh, reading the book, they can look up about jingle dress dancers. They can look up about uh, fancy shawl dancers, uh, women's traditional, men's traditional, men's grass dance and men's fancy dancers. She's, we've got, um, she drew some artwork on all of them. Um, so we, we just had so much fun collaborating uh, late at night. You know, what, what should Grandma Great Walker wear? Um, um, what should the what should the ladies wear? Well, they should wear um, ribbon skirts and so on. So we had a lot of fun. Okay, the the lights going in and out on the sun. Holy cow, the sun. Okay, so um, so we had a lot of a lot of fun with that. And I tried to incorporate. Well, I did incorporate some Ojibwe words also. Uh, and there's a glossary in the back of the book. And um, also a tradition for. A lot of our, our dancers, especially the, the females, is in order to have the right to wear a plume, you need to have your tribal name. And so uh, in the book, uh, we asked Grandma Great Walker, and we asked the Great Walker family if we can use their name. And Grandma Great Walker actually did name uh, myself and my daughter when, when she was young. So within the, within the book, uh, Josie gives a Sema, our tobacco to Grandma Great Walker and uh, asked her to dream her, her, her spirit name or her, her Ojibwe name. And Grandma Great Walker um, names her Migazin Sikwe, our young eagle woman. And there's, there's a, a longer story in, involved with that. So, um, so it, was, it was a lot of fun uh, working with, um, with the illustrator. Thank you, Mingwich. Yes, that sounds wonderful because I know so often, you know, sometimes authors and illustrators work so closely together and then other times they maybe are in completely separate places and, and don't see one another. So it sounds like a wonderful experience. So, so to, on to South Dakota, Lauren, um, you also worked with an illustrator and I don't know what your experience was, but that, that was partly necessary in order to, you know, create this as a picture book. What made you decide to have a picture book rather than some other genre, you know, a, a, for older elementary or YA, what made a picture book right for this? And how was your illustrator, Felicia Hoshino, uh, instrumental in that? Yes, and she was. Um, but I 
I used to teach elementary school and then I homeschooled my own children. And so I know the power that can come with a picture book that you can communicate to your children with a short text, but with some images that they can take with them. And um, Kenny's story is, I felt really important for younger people to have, uh, we could have, I've interviewed him for on and off for several years um, before he passed away and uh, we could have put together a longer book, but I felt that it was important for younger kids to be able to hear his message, which is that he felt very ordinary growing up. He was the son of farmers. He lived in a small community and he just felt like he was kind of an ordinary guy. But he grew up to do, we know the rest of the story, which is he grew up to be do extraordinary things. Um, he had a very long service record with the military. He didn't even know how many medals he had earned. We discovered those um, and had a ceremony for him that where the, the army came in pinned them on and he would say he said these aren't mine and we said yes they are and so and and then he went back to his community and he again he just felt like he was had a job to do and he did it uh, but he he was the one of the mail carriers and the assistant postmaster general for his little town and people loved him they remember his kindness his hard work his service to everyone he was willing to to help wherever he was needed. And I think that this is what kids need to know today, that you can feel ordinary, but you can do things to help the people around you, which really become extraordinary. And and once in a while, we get to, to tell them in a big way, like in a picture book. It was very special to have Felicia Hoshino do the illustrations. Uh, South Dakota Historical Society Press is who published the book and they chose her, but they, she, her, her art just brings, in my opinion, brings in the colors of the Black Hills, which were really important to Kenny and his family, that area. Uh, but also she had great uncles who served in the same unit of soldiers as Kenny did during World War II. So that's just really a fun, a fun thing to be able to um, share with children. I feel like with historical fiction or it's based on a true story, historical narrative, kids often feel distanced from that. And I like to, to show them a picture of me with Kenny and then show them the book and say, now you know Kenny too. And they realize that it really wasn't that long ago and that people have done things that do impact their lives and that they can be this, they can follow that example and do the same. Yes, what a, what a wonderful message. And I think we all feel ordinary most of our lives. And so what a great story to tell. So moving on to Texas, and I'm gonna continue the theme of the last couple of, of uh, questions and ask you about your favorite aspects of Daniel Miare's illustrations in Mel Plants a Tree, and forgive me if I pronounced his name wrong. What, are, what did you enjoy about uh, the way that he brought that to life? Yeah, so a lot of um, a lot of times when people are talking about the book, they talk about the amazing color palette in the book, and I agree. I think that it's really inviting. It's really warm. It makes you want to leap into the illustrations and spend some time in this in near this tree and around these people. And people often talk about how he uses light in the book. And there are a lot of instances, you know, with them outdoors, but also with light coming into indoor spaces that gives it a really soft and warm quality. And there's a big theme of family in this book and um, just kind of feeling that comfort of being around family and being in a familiar place and being embraced by by the people around you who who provide a loving environment. And I think with that warmth and with that light, um, that really comes through. And then also, like I spoke about before, the two different timelines, having to tell those two different stories and go back and forth between them and figuring out ways to clue young readers into what was happening. Um, having that yellow dress that I mentioned earlier is really helpful because when I talk to students about it, a lot of times I'll 
I'll say, oh, is this, so do you think that this is Nell on the cover? And they'll say, yes. And I'll say, this isn't Nell. That's a, understandable to think that. It makes sense to think that, but this isn't Nell. But I'll give you a clue. If you read the book, look for Nell and she's always wearing a yellow dress. And so they can pinpoint when she comes in at different ages based on what she's wearing. And that was really, really wonderful. So, um, I mean, he brought so many amazing things to this book. It's hard to pick just a few, but, but those are my top favorites. That sounds great. So both just the atmosphere and also the storytelling both come into that. That's wonderful. And back to Utah, Melissa. Um, you know, I'm wondering why, you know, you mentioned the main story character in uh, this book is an owl. Um, how did you come up with that particular character? And how do you, in general, decide what animals you're going to focus on while you're telling the story of these parks um, in general? Well, I mentioned um, a little bit earlier that I like to incorporate endangered species in my books. And on my fourth book, which I wrote about um, the endangered black-footed ferrets in South Dakota. And so I had the premise of the idea about writing about Utah's dark skies. So I usually have a bird that um, tells that tells the story of my books. And so I Googled um, endangered birds in Utah. And then I came up with, you know, so I came up with the owl and, um, I'm actually in the midst of translating this into Spanish. And so knowing it's a Mexican spotted owl, and then a lot of people say, well, how do you come up with the name? And both my boys were soccer players when they were growing up. And when they would score a goal, they would say, ole, ole, ole. And so that's how we um, came up with the name of the owl in our book. And it's basically a story of the owl circling around our state um, looking for its partner. And so there are little glimpses that Ole hears his partner in the distance. And then, I mean, not to give too much of the story away, but of course he meets his partner and um, then they find a nest. And that's how I like to tell my stories is um, have little messages um, throughout. And so not only is Ole talking about the dark skies, but I also incorporate the phases of the moon. And we have constellations on each page is also a different constellation. Um, and I'd also, if it's okay to give credit to my amazing illustrator, who's also, she's actually from Chile, but during the process of our book, she was a student in Logan, Utah. Um, her name's Victoria Speck, and she was a delight to work with. Um, so I had a lot of fun working with her. Um, and then, so each page is a geologic um, place in Utah. And we either I would send my own photographs um, or we would share images that were like that. And she, a lot of people have really commented on her colors and her um, artistic quality. It's, it's so important in, in uh, bringing that story to life, it seems like. So that's that's wonderful. And then we're back around to Wyoming at the end of the alphabet again. And I know you talk, you are both author and illustrator. So you are, are working with yourself, essentially, so you can put everything together. Um, can you tell me a little bit about who and what has influenced your work, other authors, other artists? Um, what where do you draw that kind of inspiration from? Sure. Um, I would say I don't have one person or one thing that influences me. Uh, I see and I gather my influences from everywhere. Uh, and people, animals, events. Um, I'm always looking for that moment to be motivated and to make when something becomes meaningful to me. It becomes personal, I know I can grab an idea from it. And, uh, and usually when I get my idea, um, is it worthy to live in my story? And 
I, I look at that and, uh, and then these influences uh, around me start to take shape. But what I, I love writing, I love art, but every one of my characters has a story as well. And I know it's time consuming, but I, I do mapping. Uh, if it even is imag imagination, I map out a town. It has a, it has a road, it has a, a lake, whatever is in my story, it, it exists. And my characters, they exist. They have likes, dislikes, and I draw them, I paint them, even if it's a novel without pictures. And so I really love getting into that. And my, my studio will be filled with all these giant maps and for every book I'm working on. And it, it's like it lives, it comes alive. And so, and with that, I think influence, I would like, um, because I believe that words are so powerful, they have the ability to soothe a troubled mind and art, we all know, can heal a wounded heart. You know, we all love art. And when you combine the two together in a picture book, it, I, I, it's just magical. And so, yeah, I, 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 again, I can't name one influence, but I do know that um, when an author or illustrator works from a point of uh, uh, authority, they know their work. You can feel it in that story. And, uh, and so that's, you know, just commending on, on the authors here, um, the authority I feel, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.